This episode is brought to you by Verizon Wireless. Hey, welcome to Fundamentals. This is a show where we get you primed on the basic lore behind the stuff you're interested in. It's a pretty straightforward premise. This week we're talking about the history of the people behind the new Star Wars series, The Mandalorian, The Mandalorians. At first glance, Mandalorians might just seem like folks from the planet Mandalore led by figureheads called Mandalores, but trust me, there is so so much Mandamore lore. Mandy Moore. I love Mandy Moore. Underrated performer. So, let's get into it. People love Mandalorians, thanks in large part to a single nod from a guy in a very cool costume that he stole, an entire dedicated fan base formed. There's even cosplay groups similar to the 501st, like the Mandalorian Mercs. But when did the term Mandalorian first pop up? Was it a trading card, a comic book, or was it just passed on knowledge, like how we know they're called Ewoks, even though no one in Return of the Jedi said Ewoks? Yeah, that's true. Go back and watch it. Never say it once. The origins of the term comes from the behind-the-scenes work on *The Empire Strikes Back*. Ralph McQuarrie and Joe Johnston originally designed a group of super commandos from the Mandalore system, with all-white armor and built-in weapons. These super troopers, not those super troopers, these super troopers, never made it into the film. However, the armor was adjusted, painted, and given to the non-Mandalorian armor-stealing bounty hunter known as Boba Fett, who, as we all know, first appeared in the 1978 San Anselmo County Fair Parade. Dwayne Dunham, then an assistant film editor on The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, wore the costume, which is honestly amazing. I love this. Can you imagine Disney debuting a new Star Wars character like this now? Just like, hey, come on down and meet Poe Dameron, appearing at Ham Days in Marion County, Kentucky. He'll be taking pictures between the face painting and the ham. Google Ham Days, it's real, and it's awesome. Shout out to Marion County, Kentucky. The fandom met the character officially in the infamous Star Wars Holiday Special. During a trippy animated sequence, it seems to have inspired Jon Favreau more than you'd expect. The Holiday Special gets a lot of flack, but that animated short is legit awesome. Now, the Empire Strikes Back novelization adds more specificity to the idea of the Mandalorian armor by describing Fett as wearing armor worn by a group of evil warriors defeated by the Jedi Knights during the Clone Wars. But at this point, there's still no general public facing mention of the term Mandalorian until Marvel's Star Wars comic line following Empire's release. The cult of Boba Fett had already started to grow, and many non-canon Marvel stories started to roll out in which the Mandalorians were originally comprised of different species and had several different leaders, or Mandalores, that led them through war after war. Now, while some elements remain in canon history, most of it's drastically different. But one thing remained. They all had Boba Fett's cool armor that he stole. From there, Star Wars Legends was off to the races. Author Karen Travis introduced a large amount of Mandalorian history, culture, and even language to her expanded universe Republic Commando books. But here's the problem. No one really ran any of this by George, and he just ignored, like, all of it. All the time. So, what Mandalorian stuff actually counts if you want to do some binging before the show premieres? Most of the info we consider canon is only found in the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels TV series. And good news for you, Clone Wars and Rebels are really great shows. In fact, Clone Wars is where they confirm that Jango Fett, Boba's clone dad, Star Wars is weird, stole that armor that they stole. Jango Fett was a common bounty hunter. How he acquired that armor is beyond me. So, what is a Mandalorian? Well, I wasn't making a joke. The Mandalorians are from the planet Mandalore. The leaders are called Mandalores. The planet's an outer rim planet in the Mandalore sector. So, the quiz at the end of this video is gonna be real easy. The answers are Mandalore, Mandalore, Mandalorian, Mandalore, ham days. For the most part, the Mandalorians in canon and legends were an ancient culture that stretched back before the start of the Republic. They were considered warlike. However, in the Clone Wars animated series, we learned of the pacifistic new Mandalorians who have rejected Mandalorian war culture. Most of what's considered Mandalorian space was created after the ancient Mandalorians crusaded throughout the galaxy. But when they moved to the inner rim of the galaxy, they ran into trouble, the Jedi. The Jedi beat them and started a long-term rivalry. In fact, most Mandalorian weaponry was designed to combat their force-wielding foes in a series of Mandalorian Jedi Wars. Now, I don't know what jetpacks and wrist rockets were supposed to do against a bunch of space wizards, but they at least won the fashion war. That armor is awesome. The last war with the Jedi left the planet surface of Mandalore devastated. Scorch the Earth, that's the Jedi way. This forced the Mandalorians to build biodome cities, like in that Polly Shore movie. Clone Wars continued to flesh out Mandalorians by taking us to the planet and introducing key characters like pacifist leader Duchess Satine, opposed by her sister Bo-Katan, and the Death Watch. 
If you like Game of Thrones and wish it had been in space, you're in luck. They've got a ruler, tons of houses comprised of clans, and plenty of conflict. Less incest, though. The Clone Wars series follows this conflict pretty closely. Now, in the broadest of strokes, Duchess Satine's new Mandalorian pacifist movement has kept up a state of peace, even keeping her people out of the Clone Wars. This doesn't sit well with everyone, which leads to insurgence movements, including the Death Watch, an exiled group secretly led by Satine's sister and a guy voiced by Jon Favreau. The Republic sends the Jedi to protect Satine, and she and Obi-Wan Kenobi fall in love, which should not surprise you. Y'all know Obi-Wan can get it. You've seen that gif. Mandalore basically becomes the site of a proxy war between the Jedi and Count Dooku, and eventually escalates to include Maul, who at this point had dropped the Darth. If you've ever wondered what happened to that guy between getting cut in half and showing up in Solo, A Star Wars Story, here it is. Again, in broad strokes, Maul takes control of Mandalore and things escalate quickly, Anchorman style. That escalated quickly. How does it all end? Uh, actually, I don't know. It'll be revealed in the new season of The Clone Wars when they cover the Siege of Mandalore, which is one of the final battles of The Clone Wars. Why do I know more about The Clone Wars than our actual wars? Because I'm a trash person. Now there's two more things I want to cover. A really neat sword and a really neat graffiti artist. Because if you want to know about Mandalorians, you need to know about the Darksaber. Now, if you think the idea of a Mandalorian Jedi that created a unique lightsaber variant that's cooler than normal lightsabers sounds a little silly and dumb, you're not necessarily wrong, but I choose to embrace that silly dumb. Tar Vizsla, the first Mandalorian Jedi, created the sword, which was kept by the Jedi after his death because it was too dope. The Mandalorian stole it back, and it eventually symbolized the leader of Mandalore, like Excalibur for King Arthur, but like, a lot cooler. No offense, King Arthur, but the sword's stupid. You make me sad. So be it. And that brings us to my favorite Mandalore, which is sadly not a new podcast by Karen Kilgariff, but should be. Tweet at her. Sabine Wren's story is told in Star Wars Rebels, and she really puts a human face on the Mandalorian lore, which is saying something when the key part of the lore is a scary mask and you can't see their face. She's disconnected from Mandalorian culture and eventually finds her way from Imperial student to rebel to wielding the Darksaber. After all of that, it's ironic that none of this lore touches the original trilogy. The only Mandalorian stuff even present is the stolen armor on Boba Fett. As of now, we don't know where the people of Mandalore stood during the Galactic Civil War. Did they fight? Did they even get involved? Were they all at Dexter Jetster's diner? I don't know, but maybe we'll find out in The Mandalorian. Maybe we'll find out that they were all at Ham Days. So that should give you plenty of Mandalore while you wait for the Mandalorian. Those puns, they just, they hurt, they sting. Thanks for watching and let us know what fandoms you want us to dive into next and hopefully the ones we can keep making lore puns with because that's all I have. This episode was brought to you by Verizon Wireless.